Welcome to Haunted MTL's reading of one of the most beloved ghost stories of all time, A Christmas Carol. Each day, one of our writers will bring you another stave of the classic chilling tale. So grab a warm drink, join us by the fire, and listen as David Davis brings us stave one, Marley's Ghost. A Christmas Carol, stave one, Marley's Ghost. Marley was dead, to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was as good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Mind, I don't mean to say that I know, or of my own knowledge, what is particularly dead about a doornail. I might have been inclined myself to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery of the trade, but the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and my unhallowed hand shall not disturb it, or the country's done for. You will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend, and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event, but that he was an excellent man of business on the very day of the funeral and solemnized it with an undoubted bargain. The mention of Marley's funeral brings me back to the point where I started from. There's no doubt that Marley was dead. This must be distinctly understood or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. If we were not perfectly convinced that Hamlet's father died before the play began, there would be nothing more remarkable in his taking a stroll at night in an easterly wind upon his own ramparts than there would be in any other middle-aged gentleman rashly turning out after dark in a breezy spot, say St. Paul's Churchyard, for instance, literally to astonish his son's weak mind. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name, There it stood, years afterwards, above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people knew to call the business Scrooge, Scrooge, and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. Secret and self-contained, and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. A frosty rhyme was on his head, and his eyebrows, and his wiry chin. He carried his own low temperature, always about with him. He iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw one degree at Christmas. External heat and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm, no wintry weather could chill him. No wind that blew was bitterer than he. No falling snow was more intent upon its purpose, no pelting rain less open to entreaty. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him in only one respect. They often, quote, came down handsomely, and Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, with gladsome looks, my dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him. And when they saw him coming on, they would tug their owners into doorways and up courts and would wag their tails as though they said, no eye is all the better than an evil eye, dark master. But what did Scrooge care? He was the very thing he liked to edge his way along in crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance and what the knowing ones called nuts to Scrooge. Once upon a time of all the good days in the year on Christmas Eve, Old Scrooge sat busy at his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy withal, and he could hear the people in the court outside, 
go wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. The city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. It had not been light all day, and candles were flaring in the windows of the neighboring offices, like ruddy smears upon the palpable brown air. The fog came pouring in at every chink and keyhole, and was so dense without that although the court was of the narrowest, the houses opposite were mere phantoms. To see the dingy cloud come drooping down, obscuring everything, one might have thought that nature lived hard by, and was brewing on a large scale. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep an eye out upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. But he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room, and so surely as the clerk came in with the shovel, the master predicted that it would be nece necessary for them to part. Whether the clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of strong imagination, failed. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quick that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. Bah! said Scrooge. Humbug! He had so heated himself with the rapid walking in the fog and frost, this nephew of Scrooge's, that he was all in glow. His face was ruddy and handsome, his eyes sparkled, and his breath smoked again. Christmas a humbug, uncle, said Scrooge's nephew. You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do, said Scrooge. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come then, returned the nephew gaily. What right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Scrooge, having no better answer ready than the spur of the moment, said, bah, again, and followed it up with a humbug. Don't be cross, uncle, said the nephew. What else can I be, returned the uncle, when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas. Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older, but not an hour richer. A time for balancing your books and having every item in them through a round dozen of months presented dead against you. If I could work my will, said Scrooge indignantly, every idiot who goes around with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle, pleaded the nephew. Nephew, returned the uncle sternly. Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, repeated Scrooge's nephew. But you don't keep it. Leave me it alone then, said Scrooge. Much good may it do you. Much good as it has ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say, returned the nephew. Christmas among the best. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time, when it has come round, apart from the veneration due to its sacred name and origin. If anything belonging to it can be apart from that, as a good time. A kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of, in the long calendar of the year, when men and women seemed by one consent to open their shut-up shut hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave, and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good, and will do me good, and I say, God bless it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded, becoming immediately sensible to the impropriety, he poked the fire and extinguished it to the last frail spark forever. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder you didn't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Scrooge said that he would see him, yes. Indeed, he did. He went the whole length of the expression and said that he would see him in that extremity first. But why? cried Scrooge's nephew. Why? Why did you get married? said Scrooge. Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love, growled Scrooge as if that were the only thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. Nay, uncle, but you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon, said Scrooge. I am sorry, with all my, my heart, <laughs> to find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrel to which I have been a party. But I have made a trial in homage of Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon, said Scrooge. His nephew left the room without an angry word, notwithstanding. 
He stopped at the outer door to bestow the greetings of the season upon the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. There is another fellow, muttered Scrooge, who overheard him, my clerk, with 15 shillings a week and a wife and a family, talking about a Merry Christmas. I'll retire to Bedlam. This lunatic, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead for these seven years, Scrooge replied. He died seven years ago, this very night. We have no doubt in his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner, said the gentleman, presenting his credentials. It certainly was, for they had been two kindred spirits. At the ominous word of liberality, Scrooge frowned and shook his head and handed the credentials back. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute, who suffer greatly at present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons, Scrooge asked? Plenty of prisons, said the gentleman, laying down the pen again. And the union workhouses, demanded Scrooge. Are they still in operation? They are, still, returned the gentleman. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor then, said Scrooge. Both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid, from what you said at first, that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course, said Scrooge. I am very glad to hear it. Under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer or m of mind or body to the multitude, returned the gentleman, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time, of all others, when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing, Scrooge replied. You wish to be remain anonymous? I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there. And many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. But you might know it, observed the gentleman. It is not my business, Scrooge returned. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Seeing clearly that it would be useless to pursue their point, the gentleman withdrew. Scrooge resumed his labors with an improved opinion of himself and a more facetious temper that was usual for him. Meanwhile, the fog and darkness thickened so that people ran about with flaring links, proffering their services to go before the horses and carriages and conduct them on their way. The ancient tower of a church, whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at the Scrooge of the Gothic window on the wall, became invisible and struck the hours and quarters in the clouds with tremulous vibrations afterwards, as if its teeth were chattering in its frozen head up there. The cold became intense. In the main street at the corner of the court, some laborers were repairing the gas pipes and had lighted a great fire in the brazier, round which a party of ragged men and boys were gathered, warming their hands and waking their eyes before the blaze in rapture. The water plug being left in solitude, its overflowing sullenly congealed and turned to misanthropic ice. The brightness of the shops where holly sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp heat of the windows made pale faces ready as they passed. Holterers and grocers trade had become a splendid joke, a glorious pageant, with which it was next to impossible to believe that such dull principles as bargain and sale had anything to do. The Lord Mayor, in the stronghold of the mighty mansion house, gave orders to his fifty cooks and butlers to keep Christmas as a Lord Mayor's household should, and even the little tailor, whom he had fined five shillings the previous Monday for being drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, stirred up tomorrow's pudding in his garret, while his lean wife and baby sallied out to buy the beef. Foggier yet, and colder, piercing, searching, biting cold. If the good St. Dunstan had but nipped the evil spirit's nose with a touch of such weather as that, instead of using his familiar weapons, indeed he would have roared to lusty purpose. The owner of one scant young nose, gnawed and mumbled by the hungry cold as bones are gnawed by dogs, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole to regale him with a Christmas carol. But at first the sound of, God bless you, merry gentlemen, may nothing you dismay. Scrooge seized the ruler with such an energy of action that the singer fled in terror, leaving the keyhole to fog and even more congenial frost. 
At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted to the fact that to his expecting clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose, said Scrooge. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, said Scrooge, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used. I'd be bound. The clerk smiled faintly. And yet, said Scrooge, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. The clerk observed that it was only once a year. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December, said Scrooge, buttoning his great coat up to his chin. But I suppose you must have the whole day be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in the twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down a slide on Cornhill at the end of the lane of boys, 20 times, in honor of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at Blindman's Bluff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had what once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy little suite of rooms in a lowering pile of building up a yard, where it had so little business to be that one could scarcely help fancying it must have run there when it was a young house, playing hide-and-seek with the other houses, and forgetting the way out again. It was old enough now, and dreary enough, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms being all let out as offices. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, was fain to grope with his hands. The fog and frost so hung about the black old gateway of the house that it seemed as if the genius of the weather sat in mournful meditation over the threshold. Now, it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker of the door, except that it was a very large. It is also a fact that Scrooge hadn't seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. Also, that has a little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London, even including, which is a bold word, the corporation, alderman, and library. Let it also be borne in mind that Scrooge had not bestowed one thought of Marley since his last mention of his seven years dead partner that afternoon. And then let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face. It was not an impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard were, but had a dismal light about it like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. He was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned upon its ghostly forehead. The hair was curiously stirred, as if by breath or hot air, and, though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. That, and its livid color, made it horrible. But its horror seemed to be in spite of the face and beyond its control, rather than, it, than a part of its own expression. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. To say that he was not startled, or that his blood was not conscious of a terrible sensation to which it had been a stranger from infancy, would be untrue. But he put his hand upon the key he had relinquished, turned it sturdily, walked in, and lighted his candle. He did pause, with a moment's irresolution, before he shut the door, and he did look cautiously behind it first, as if he half expected to be terrified with the sight of Marley's pigtail sticking out into the hall. But there was nothing on the back of the door, except the screws and nuts that held the knocker on. So he said, poo poo, and closed it with a bang. The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant cellars below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs slowly too, trimming his candle as he went. You may talk vaguely about driving a coach and six up a good old flight of stairs or through a bad young act of parliament, but I mean to say you might have got a hearse up that staircase and taken it broadside with the splinter bar towards the wall and towards the balustrades and done it easily. There was plenty of width for that and room to spare, which is perhaps the reason why Scrooge thought he saw a locomotive hearse going on before him in the gloom. Half a dozen gas lamps out of the street wouldn't have lighted the entry too well, so you may suppose that it was pretty dark with Scrooge's dip. Up Scrooge went, not carrying a button for that. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. 
Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa. A small fire in the grate, spoon and basin ready, and the little saucepan of gruel, Scrooge had a cold in his head, upon the hob. Nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Lumber room as usual, old fire guard, old shoes, two fish baskets, washing stand on three legs, and a poker. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in, double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to take his gruel. It was a very low fire indeed, nothing on such a bitter night. He was obliged to sit close to it and brood over it, before he could extract the least sensation of warmth from such a handful of fuel. The fireplace was an old one, built by some Dutch merchant long ago, and paved all around with quaint Dutch tiles designed to illustrate the scriptures. There were Cain's and Abel's, Pharaoh's daughters, queens of Sheba, angelic messengers ascending through the air on clouds like feather beds, Abraham's, Belshazzar's, apostles putting off to sea in butter boats, hundreds of figures to attract his thoughts. And yet that face of Marley, seven years dead, came like the ancient prophet's rod and swallowed up the whole. If each smooth tile had been a blanket first, with power to shape from picture on its surface from the disjointed fragments of his thoughts, there would have been a copy of old Marley's head on every one. Humbug, said Scrooge, and walked across the room. After several turns, he sat down again, and he threw his head back in the chair. His glance happened to rest upon the bell, a disused bell that hung in the room and communicated for some purpose now forgotten with a chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and with a strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. It swung so softly in the outset that it scarcely made a sound, but soon it rang loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This might have lasted a half a minute or a minute, but it seemed an hour. The bells ceased as they had begun together. They were succeeded by a clanking noise deep down below, as if some person were dragging out a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. Scrooge then remembered to have heard that ghosts and haunted houses were described as dragging chains. The cellar door flew open with a booming sound, and then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. It's humbug still, said Scrooge. I won't believe it. His color changed, though, when without a pause, it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Upon its coming in, the dying flame leaped up as though it cried, I know him, Marley's ghost, and fell again. The same face, the very same. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights, and boots. The tassels on the ladder bristling like his pigtail, and his coat skirts and hair upon his head. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail, and was made, for Scrooge observed it closely, of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge observing him and looking through his waistcoat could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Scrooge has often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he had never believed until now. No, nor did he believe it even now. Though he looked the phantom through and through, and saw it standing before him, though he felt the chilling influence of its death, cold eyes, and marked the very texture of the folded kerchief bound about its head and chin, which wrapper he had not observed before, he was still incredulous and fought against his senses. How now, said Scrooge, caustic and as cold as ever, what do you want with me? Much, Marley's voice, no doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then, said Scrooge, raising his voice. You're particular for a shade, he was going to say, to a shade, but substituted this as more appropriate. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, can you sit down, asked Scrooge, looking doubtfully at him. I can. Do it then. Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair, and felt that in the event of it being impossible, it might involve the necessity of an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace, as if he were quite used to it. You don't believe in me, observed the ghost. I don't, said Scrooge. What evidence would you have for my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know, said Scrooge. Why do you doubt your senses? Because, said Scrooge, a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of a grave about you, whatever you are. Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is 
that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his terror. For the specter's voice disturbed the very marrow in his bones. To sit, staring at those fixed glaze eyes in silence for a moment, would play, Scrooge felt, the very deuce with him. There was something very awful, too, in the specter's being provided with an infernal atmosphere of its own. Scrooge could not feel it himself, but this was clearly the case. For though the ghost sat perfectly motionless, its hair and skirts and tassels were still agitated as by the hot vapor from an oven. You see this toothpick, said Scrooge, returning quickly to the charge for the reason just assigned, and wishing, though it were only for a second, to divert the vision stony gaze from himself. I do, said the ghost. You are not looking at it, said Scrooge. But I see it, said the ghost, notwithstanding. Well, returned Scrooge, I have but to swallow this and be for the rest of my days persecuted by a legion of goblins, all of my own creation. Humbug, I tell you, humbug. At this, the spirit raised a frightful cry and shook its chain with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge held on tight to his chair to save himself from falling in a swoon. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom taking out the bandage around his head as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped upon its breast. Scrooge fell upon his knees and clasped his hands before his face. Mercy, he said. Dreadful apparition. Why do you trouble me? Man of this worldly mind, replied the ghost. Do you believe in me or not? I do, said Scrooge. I must. But why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? It is required of every man, the ghost returned, that the spirit within him should, should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. Oh, woe is me. And witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth and turned to happiness. Again, the specter raised a cry and shook its chain and wrung its shadowy hands. You are fettered, said Scrooge trembling. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, replied the ghost. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you? Scrooge trembled more and more. Or would you know, pursued the ghost, the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself. It was full, as heavy, and as long as this, seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor in the expectation of finding himself surrounded by some 50 or 60 fathoms of iron cable, but he could see nothing. Jacob, he said, imploringly. Old Jacob Marbley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give, the ghost replied. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge, and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. Nor can I tell you what I would. A very little more is all permitted to me. I cannot rest, I cannot stay, I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me, in my life, my spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me, in my life, spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hull, and weary journeys lie before me. It was a habit with Scrooge, whenever he became thoughtful, to put his hand in his breeches' pockets. Pondering on what the ghost had said, he did so now, but without lifting up his eyes or getting off his knees. You must have been very slow about it, Jacob, Scrooge observed, in a businesslike manner, though with the humility and deference. Slow, the ghost repeated. Seven years dead, mused Scrooge, and traveling all that time. The whole time, said the ghost. No rest, no peace, incessant tortures of remorse. You travel fast, said Scrooge. On the wings of the wind, replied the ghost. You might have got over a great deal of quantity of ground in seven years, said Scrooge. The ghost, upon hearing this, set up another cry and clanked its chain so hideously in the dead silence of the night that the ward could have been justified in indicting it for nuisance. O oh, captive bound in double iron, cried the phantom, not to know that ages of incessant labor by immoral creatures for this earth must pass into eternity, not to know that any Christian spirit working kindly on its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness, not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life opportunity misused. Yet such was I, oh, such was I. But you're always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business, cried the ghost, wringing his hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings in my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive or the ocean of my business. It held up its chain at arm's length as if that were the cause of all its unavailing grief, and flung it heavily upon the ground again. At this time of the rolling year, the specter said, I suffer most. 
Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down and never raise them to that blessed star which led the wise men to the poor abode? Were there no horror homes to which this light would have conducted me? Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the specter going on at this rate and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me, cried the ghost. My time is nearly done. I will, said Scrooge, but don't be hard upon me. Don't be flowery, Jacob. Pray, how is it that I appear before you in the shape that you can see? I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you for many and many a day. It was not an agreeable idea. Scrooge shivered and wiped the perspiration from his brow. That is no light part of my penance, pursued the ghost. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance of hope of escaping my fate. A chance and hope of my peering, Ebenezer. You're always a good friend to me, said Scrooge. Thank ye. You will be haunted, resumed the ghost, by three spirits. Scrooge's countenance fell almost as low as the ghosts had done. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? He demanded in a faltering voice. It is. I, I think I'd rather not, said Scrooge. Without their visits, said the ghost, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Hinted Scrooge. Expect the second one on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to me no more and look to that for your own sake to remember what has passed between us. When it had said these words, the specter took its wrapper from the table and bound it round its head as before. Scrooge knew this by the smart sound of its teeth made when the jaws were brought together by the bandage. He ventured to raise his eyes again and found his supernatural visitor confronting him in an erect attitude with its chain wound over and about its arm. The apparition walked backwards from him and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little so that when the specter reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to approach, which he did. When they were within two paces of each other, Marley's ghost held up its hand, warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped, not so much in obedience as in surprise and fear, for on the raising of the hand, he became sensible of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, wailings inexpressibly sorrowful and self-accusatory. The specter, after listening for a moment, joined in the mournful dirge and floated out upon the bleak dark night. Scrooge followed to the window. Desperate in his curiosity, he looked out. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few, they might be guilty governments, were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with that one old ghost in a high waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being able to assist a wretched woman with an infant whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost that power forever. Whether these creatures faded into the mist or the mist enshrouded them, he could not tell. But they and their spirit voices faded together, and the night became as it had been when he walked home. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked, and he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say humbug, but stopped at the first syllable, and being from the, motion, the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed without undressing, and he fell asleep upon the instant. Hello, this was David Davis with the first stav of The Christmas Carol. Uh, it was very fun to read. I am going to go ahead and plug the California Association of Food Banks because I am a California-bound writer here at Haunted MTL. So if you're looking for a food bank to support, definitely look at them. Otherwise, get ready for the second part of A Christmas Carol very soon.